Welcome back to the radio of Mary Martins, and my guest today speaks to the subject of remote viewing from a applied standpoint. He is the leading scholar studying remote viewing today and the director of the Foresight Institute, which has done tremendous work over the years on projects related to remote viewing, bold standpoint, and of putting out publications to the public to enable them to understand the outcomes and methodology of remote viewing. And my guest today is Courtney Brown, PhD. Courtney, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Great. I want to thank you so much, Randy, for inviting me on the show. I'm really eager to, to be here. Hey, thanks for taking time out. It's a beautiful day here. It probably is down where you are, too. So um, you give up a little bit of things to be able to do these kind of, kind of shows, and I appreciate your time. Yep. We have a sunny day today, and actually outside here in Atlanta, this is one of the first long-term sunny days we've had in months. We've been inundated with rain. Yeah. For, I mean, the climate is really bonkers, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, we've just gone through a very strange summer that was exceptionally cool and then went exceptionally hot for uh, probably about three weeks where the heat index was almost 110 degrees at times. Now, oh, wow. we're in, now we're in a phase where we're back to rain again and actually very moderate to low temperatures for this time of year. So for those who say that there are no climate change, I would say look outside your window and check it out for yourself. Which brings us to the subject, we discussed this last October when you were on my show live, um, the Farsight Institute's uh, global, cl yeah, global Climate Change Project, which you began in, I believe, 2008, and uh, that ramped up to uh, an expected endpoint of this June 2013. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can drop in the background for that and we'll go for that from there great yeah a tremendously successful project so we were really 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 happy with this the climate change project started in 2008 and it, this time span was five years from june 1st 2008 to june 1st 2013 and you have to understand it works in parallel with another long-standing interest and project that we've done which is called the Multiple Universe Project. So we have been investigating multiple universes, alternatively called multiple timelines, parallel timelines, uh, alternate realities, uh, for a very long time. And it's one of the most difficult things for people to wrap their heads around, but it's one of the most important findings that we have done at the Farsight Institute. Our website is just like our name, www.farsight, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeing far, dot org, because we, O-R-G, we're a non-profit, just like any um, educational organization and research organization. However, the idea of multiple realities is something that was raised by Hugh Everett, physicist in 1957, who studied under John Wheeler in Princeton. And he raised it as an interpretation of the so-called two-slit experiment in quantum mechanics. He was widely ridiculed, widely laughed at, was so disgusted he left physics and became uh, a member of the work that worked in the Defense Department uh, and helped shape our nuclear policies. But time has changed, and his interpretation of quantum mechanics, called variously called uh, the other worlds interpretation or um, mul sometimes multiple universes interpretation, but it's most commonly referred to as the other worlds interpretation, uh, is now accepted by 18% of physicists. So as the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it is generalizable to the macro world that we live in. So the dominant way of thinking in his day and still today was the Copenhagen interpretation, which started in the early parts of the 20th century. And it was pioneered and championed by people like Niels Bohr and Herner Weisenberg. And the idea was that there's a probabilistic ether that things materialize from on the quantum level, but they don't really exist. They just exist in sort of a probable realm. And then when you register them or observe them in some ways, John Wheeler noted, they become real. 
like a photon doesn't really exist until boom it's observed or registered in some in some way and it snaps out of the probabilistic ether so you require this outside force this outside agency of registration or observing or looking in order to snap something real out of something that's sort of not real and that was always a problem but that was the interpretation that they had because the behavior of quantum mechanics seemed to act that way but it was a theory that was based on the idea that there's only one reality that there's only one of us there's only one version of anything yes. and so they had to have a probabilistic thing that doesn't exist snap into a real thing that does exist in order to maintain the idea that there's a unique version of us and Hugh Everett came you know, along and said that's a monstrosity of an idea that you're, what you're trying to do is preserve an illusion that you have just so, so to create a, a theory of reality that matches your illusion but reality is to have an outside force needed to trigger something real to pop out of something that's not real is just ridiculous what you can have is a situation in which all those other worlds all those other versions of everything simultaneously exist in an equal way and what you do is rather than popping them out into a real world you're tuning into them as you observe them so it's not a matter of popping them out into a one unique real world but you tuning in to which version you want mm -hmm. in the very same way that you have a radio and you have multiple frequencies on the radio broadcasting and sometimes you tune into one station and listen to it and you're completely oblivious to the other stations that are broadcasting yes. unless you change the frequency and then tune into them and then the other frequency you are listening to is for all intents and purpose non-existence and so the same thing is for television and if you can imagine that maybe 10 years into the future 15 years into the future we'll have 3d televisions so you'll have luke skywalker and princess leah in the middle of your tele in your middle of your living room you know as real as day right it's not hard to imagine that future the way technology is advancing and so somebody who's a bit primitive will walk into your living room and say oh what is luke skywalker and princess leah doing in your living room and you'd have to tell them it's just a bunch of frequencies interacting they're not really there and they look and they say they look real to me <laughs> so yeah that's what's going on but physicists have had a very difficult time wrapping their heads around this because on an emotional level they want to purchase the idea that there's only one version of them but anyway Everett came along and, and basically made an argument that that there is a new because everything is frequency based and I'm at, at the university I don't do any of this work at the university my university but at the university I am an applied mathematician that works in this in a social science program mm -hmm. so no one's ever uh, disagreed with Hugh Everett's mathematics in fact no one ever disagrees with the mathematics of quantum mechanics generally it's the interpretation of what's going on that people disagree with and so when he published his dissertation and, and, a, and a related article there was a famous physicist at the time Bryce DeWitt who wrote to him and said you know you're claiming that at every moment of the now like now and now and now there is a branching that occurs so realities branch out they fork out at every moment of the now and a potentially infinite variety of new ones and so in that sense it's impossible to predict a future because there is no one future at every moment of the now multiple futures exist so which one are you going to predict if there's an infinite variety of them and Bryce DeWitt wrote back wrote to um, Hugh Everett and say and said you know you're claiming in your theory that there's a branching at every moment of the now mathematically I don't have any troubles with what you're doing but this is ridiculous it's so stupid there is no branching I do where's the branching I don't see any branching I'm just here there's no branching Mm -hmm. and Hugh Everett's response to that was well you know that's the same argument they gave against Copernicus when he said that the Sun doesn't revolve around the earth it rather is reverse the reverse the earth revolves around the Sun 
And people looked at him and said, that's so stupid. What are you talking about? Look up in the morning. The sun is on that side of the sky. And in the evening, it's flown over to that side. It's obviously moving. We're not moving. I don't see anything moving. If we mm -hmm. were moving, we'd be flying about all over the place. Yeah. We're steady. We're rock solid. But that was before the time of Newton before they understood force equals mass times acceleration, before they understood that a, a system in motion won't detect motion unless it changes motion. And that was before Einstein's, also uh, before his, uh, his special theory of relativity, which you know, expanded upon the Newtonian concepts. So th the idea is that, and Bryce DeWitt, when he got that argument back from Hugh Everett, said, touche, I mean, it's true. What Hugh Everett was arguing for was a complete new understanding of physics. And Bryce DeWitt was trying to understand the branching based on the prior understanding of physics, that there's only one reality, it's what we see in front of us. And so we did a full year uh, examination of Hugh Everett's hypothesis of multiple realities or other worlds. And we had that result of that project, that year-long project, published in the leading peer-reviewed scientific journal. And if you go to our website, at www.farsight.org. If you go down the home page a little bit, you can actually see the, um, the article by, it's sort of near the bottom of the nav bar in the middle. It says, latest peer-reviewed published research. Click on that and you can see the article. And so that was a very successful project where we had a theory we had a prediction, and we had a result. And it confirmed Hugh Everett's interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is generalizable to the macro world. So you don't have to have one set of laws affecting the quantum world, and then another set of laws affecting the, 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 the macro, big world. So that would mean there's different versions of us. I mean, I can see you in the video, you have a blue shirt. There's another version of you where you're wearing a, ye a yellow shirt. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, and there's another version of me where I'm not wearing a white shirt, but I'm wearing an a, a olive-colored shirt or something. And there's another interview, there's another version of you w in which you made a serious mistake and interviewed somebody else rather than me. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, you know, there's infinite versions, and you can sort of say, well, where are they? Now, conventional physicists said, this is impossible because it violates the conservation of energy, creating new universes. Well, it doesn't. See, they're still stuck in their, in, in their old way of thinking. All of the other realities, they already exist. So you're not creating anything new. So they're just, you can't see them because they're out of sync with frequencies. Physicists, physicists have never found anything solid, ever. They have computers and cars and bodies, but those are made up of molecules with empty space. And then inside the molecules, there's atoms. Inside the atoms, there's subatomic particles. And inside the subatomic particles, you keep breaking them down and breaking them down. And what you get is only waveforms interacting using principles of constructive and destructive interference. They have never found anything like a solid billiard ball thing that doesn't, that, you know, that, that exists, never. So there is never been a discovery of anything solid in all of physics anywhere ever. So all that we have is frequencies. So you and I are like a, tele like a 3D television projection. And it's very real. That's why the illusion works so well. We can't see the other versions of us because they're out of sync with regard to frequency. But they exist. And if we think about our brain as comparable to a radio or television receiver, what our brains are are very complex hologram generators. Their main purpose is to screen out all frequencies except the one of the now that it wants us to see. That's how we get the illusion of time. The brains sync up to a, a sequence that moves yeah. forward. Yeah. But basically what we have is a, a brain that is saying, you don't need to see the gazelle of yesterday and you don't need to see the elephant of tomorrow. You need to see the lion of today that's staring at you in order to survive. So it screens out absolutely everything. Remote viewing works because people who are trained using the procedures that were developed by the U.S. military and used for espionage purposes or procedures that are derivative of those methodologies are used to help the remote viewers learn to allow frequencies in that the brain otherwise screens out. 
And it's the same thing as going to the Olympics and seeing people who can jump higher, run faster, swim faster, do crazy gymnastics that we can't do. They trained until their bodies and minds were in sync and were able to do it. So basically that's how the remote viewers work. We have a radio receiver or a receiver as a brain. They fiddle with it, pushing at the edges until they, using these procedures, can get these other impressions and sort of lock into them. So with the multiple universes perspective, we entered this climate project knowing that we could not predict the future. But we said, let's try to predict two futures. Let's try to describe two futures five years in advance and then see if there's any correlation between those futures and what we actually experienced. The details mm -hmm. will be different, but maybe some of the major stuff will be the same. That was the theory. And the hope was that if we could see some of the correlation between the major things that happened in those two futures and our future, then we'd have an ability to predict the essence of what is coming even if we couldn't predict the details. So if there was going to be an earthquake, and we did have an earthquake experiment that, that worked out perfectly with regard to this type of idea, if there was going to be an earthquake, the remote viewers might pick up a devastating earthquake. And when we do the analysis, we'll be able to locate when it happened, where it happened. We'll get that right, where and when. But it may be a very significant earthquake, but not devastating when it actually happens. And we actually had that experiment with a Los Angeles International Airport experiment that we did in 2008. And we predicted to the day that there would be a major earthquake on the end of July 2008. And in fact, at the end of July 2008, um, there was a 5.8 magnitude earthquake that hit Los Angeles, it shut down the cell phone system because everybody was so panicky because everyone was calling everybody else. But it didn't devastate Los Angeles, which is what the remote viewers picked up. So with our current project, the climate project, we were expecting something, else, something similar. Now originally we were thinking we were going to find small climate change because all the meteorologists were saying that climate is just climate, it doesn't change very much. So whatever you see in 2008 will be what you're going to see five years from then. It's the same as if you're looking in 1968 and then going to 1973. You wouldn't expect any difference. So, and so that's what we were expecting from a meteorological perspective. But the remote viewing data came in and said the climate had just gone bonkers. I mean, it was totally different in the sense that just really wacky weather and much more volatile weather. And secondly, we had something related to meteor impacts coming in before June 1st, 2013, to which we said, whoa, that's different. Yeah. We weren't expecting that. So we got big change. Now, from the perspective of an experiment, that made the experiment ideal. Because rather than trying to detect minor climate change, we were able to look for big stuff. So, and the meteor impact stuff was totally unpredictable from anything in mainstream science, and so was the climate change. So we sat and waited for five years, and sure enough, Two things happened. The climate over the last 12 months is bonkers. I mean, by all respects, it is bonkers. And the, um, the ability for us to describe the climate is, is basically non-existent because uh, there's a, one of our remote viewers who's worked on many projects here at Farsight is Daz Smith. He's one of the world's greatest remote viewers. And he's in Britain. He created a new project, a new website called www.climatechange2013.com. And he's cataloging in the news banner. If you click on the news banner, he's cataloging in the news section of the website all of the different things that are going on that are crazy, like China's having historic flooding. There was uh, Calgary was almost washed away. It was totally flooded. Uh, they had to evacuate Calgary and much of Alberta and in Canada. The floods that have gone through Europe are historically unprecedented. They had, they've had so many floods uh, throughout all of Europe, Europe, Germany, Holland, everywhere that, I mean, it was just, it's just been extraordinary. In India, we have floods of rivers that look like they come out of 
uh, Hollywood film, disaster films, all computer graphic generated, but they're real, where whole cities, whole towns and cities are being just literally washed away in this raging water. You had the Oklahoma City tornado, you had Hurricane Sandy, it just goes on and on. There was blizzards in, in, in Britain, and or there was snow in Britain, a lot of snow in Britain in May. And um, I don't know what the... Where are you actually, Randy? I forgot where you are. I'm, in, are. I'm in Pennsylvania. So even in Pennsylvania, you guys have had nonstop rain. Yeah. Uh, all on the East Coast. I mean, it's... And we haven't seen... I went to the beach at the end, in the beginning of July, like I typically do, down near Gulf Breeze in Pensacola region, camping. I stayed there two days and just drove back. It was just nonstop rain, and it hasn't stopped raining. And in the beginning of this interview, I said we had a sunny day, and the clouds have already come in. So I mean, and we were—it's raining every single day, nonstop. The 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 rivers, the lakes, the reservoirs are at flood level here in the South, and um, I mean, it goes on and on and on. So Dad Smith has been cataloging that, and there's other websites that are bursting up all over the place, similarly cataloging that. So. The, the climate really has gone bonkers in a way that was totally unpredictable from a meteorological perspective in 2008. In addition, the United Nations is coming out with a report, the first draft of which is already done, and much of it was released. Uh, well, it wasn't officially released, but it came out in The Economist uh, and to, to a lot of well, people. Well, that's pretty upset. official, actually, The Economist. Yeah, but yeah. But, yeah, no, the official, uh, the Economist is official, but they got an early version that wasn't mm -hmm. officially released. And now the powers that be are trying to tone it down, but th those who have seen the full thing say it will scare the wits out of everybody. They said extreme climate is now the norm and expect the worst, expect worse to come. So, you know, this was not predictable in 2008, but that's what the climate project data said, which so, you know, forget about the details. The big thing, the big picture, wacky weather, you know, hugely wacky weather, we got it. Now, what about the meteor impacts? February 15th, 2008, 2000, I'm sorry, 2013, just a few months ago, February 15th, two huge meteor events happened. We had the near hit of DA-14, the asteroid, and that flew, I mean, it was really close to the atmosphere. It flew within the orbit of our satellites. So that was as near a miss as we want to see. And it approached from the southern hemisphere. And had it hit, it would have exactly matched the climate project data for meteor impacts, especially with regard to the southern hemisphere. And we also had the Russian meteor come in within the same 24-hour period. CNN reported that the odds of those two big events occurring within the same 24-hour period is 100 million to one. So that was, that was much rarer than a once-in-a-lifetime event. The Russian meteor was odd because when it hit, there was video all over the place. Everyone has a video camera on their phone. And what we saw with the video, one video in particular was, was very, very, very clear, was that something came from behind the meteor as it was streaking overhead and impacted it, fragmenting it. Have yeah. you seen this one? I have seen that, yes. Yeah, yes, that's it's very interesting it. stuff there. Yeah, fragmenting it and blowing pieces of it out <clears> in front of it. Now, had it not happened, it would have hit Russia intact and produced a explosion equivalent to 50 times the nuclear bomb explosion that destroyed Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. So it would have been absolutely devastating and matching our climate project once again. But something hit it from behind. Now, what hit it from behind? It either has. There's only three possibilities. One is that it was a, another meteor, but really the chance of that happening, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't consider that serious, but it is a possibility, as remote as it may be. The other is that it might have been a um, part of an anti-ballistic missile system owned by the Russians or the U.S. And in fact, a Russian general did state the next day that it was in fact part of their anti-ballistic missile system. But that was pulled, that story was pulled immediately afterwards and so we can't really say for sure. Uh, the, the story raised all types of problems because that would address the weaponization of space and treaties. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. So they need plausible you don't know deniability was, in that respect. Yeah. So any. Yeah. So we don't know if that was true or not, but it, you know, someone did say it afterwards. 
Anyway, the third possibility is that it was extraterrestrial intervention, and that means that one of the worst kept secrets on the planet Earth is that there is communication interaction between mm -hmm. some extraterrestrial species and the U.S. government and perhaps also the Russian government and maybe a few others. And for various things, uh, technology transfer for favors, permissions, whatever. And if that is true, and you were a military person and you saw the results of our climate project, what would you do? You'd immediately go to them and say, hey, if there's a meteor inbound that's going to hit us, do something about it. So if DA-14 was going to hit us, if it, was, it could easily have been nudged when it was far out. They could have just about spit on it if it was far enough out, and it would have moved it slightly in order to miss the planet. Right. I mean, it was... Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and the evidence that this might have actually happened is what happened to the Russian meteor. I mean, that, that thing hitting it from behind is so clear on the video, it's hard to walk away from that. So if they were inter willing to intervene with that thing, then they could have intervened with DA-14 as well. That raises the issue of intervention, not just by extraterrestrials, or, but also by humans to change the timeline. If it was an anti-ballistic missile system, you and I know that human technology isn't that good. So they would have had to have been ready. They would have had to have been prepared. They would have had to essentially had their guns drawn. Locked and caught. loaded, ready to go. Locked and yep. loaded. And if that happened, then they would have had to have had some warning that they needed to do it at this time. And the climate project is a very likely source of that warning, either asking, either warning that led them to ask for extraterrestrial intervention or warning that led them to get their anti-ballistic missile systems ready. So the warning issue is crucial because that's exactly how you create another timeline. And that's how the climate project may have been used. Now, some of your skeptics out there are saying, oh, gosh, you're telling me that the militaries actually look at your stuff. Are you serious? This the illusions of grandeur. <laughs> well, look, yes, I know for an absolute they, fact. Yeah. They, they, they look at our stuff. This. Well, they pay attention to all of that, and they take everything that we do extremely serious. Heck, we have the military guys on our board of directors, for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no question that they look at what we do. They're on our board of directors, let alone, I mean, and the, the people that are out there, uh, you know, in military intelligence, we've communicated with them on, from uh, before, and sometimes one way, uh, sometimes both ways. But, yes, they definitely look at us. So, you know, they would have definitely seen the climate project results, and that's all they would have needed. No, they, wouldn't, they didn't call us up and say, we've seen the results and we're going to act on it. No, that never happened. But it's impossible to conclude that they didn't look at the web pages and our presentations and note it. And then these guys are very smart. It's impossible for me to think that they wouldn't have actually done something if they saw these things. They would have at least investigated it. Now, at 2008, DA-14 it wasn't even known to exist. So they would have actually had, if they were asking for extraterrestrial help, they would have asked to, they would have actually had to say, find out if something's heading our way. Because it wasn't discovered by us until December 2012. So anyway, so let's look at it from the perspective of multiple timelines. What did we get right? Well, we had climate that went bonkers, and we had potentially devastating meteor events. Now, in the climate project data, the meteors actually hit the planet. But in actuality, in our timeline, they didn't hit the planet, but they were potentially devastating and way more rare than once in a lifetime. So we got the essence correct. We got bonkers climate and potentially devastating meteor effects. And that's exactly correct. So we, this climate project was a 100% success. Now, let me be skeptical. Uh, let me play the part of the skeptic. Mm -hmm. Hey, Courtney, don't you think this is just a cop-out like it happened in another universe, and you're just saying that to avoid saying that the project didn't work and remote viewing is a failure, and it doesn't work, okay? So from that perspective, Let's look at it. First of all, if you are going to say that, you have to completely ignore 
the fact that remote viewing doesn't have an accuracy problem when remote viewing past or concurrent targets. So when these highly trained military grade remote viewers remote view events under totally blind conditions, they're never told what they're told to remote view. They're just told there's a target, remote view it. An hour later, they come out with 20 detailed pages. If they're told to tar remote view uh, a target that turns out to be the sinking of the Titanic, it's correct. They've got the wreckage at the bottom of the ocean, everything. It's the future that's the bugaboo. And the, the, f and the reason we don't have a problem with the past is because the person who's writing the target knows exactly which timeline to pick. Meaning you want the timeline where the Titanic actually sunk. You don't want the timeline where the Titanic actually got across the, uh, across the ocean and docked in New York. You want the one where it sunk, and so you're going to get that. But when you're going into the future, you don't know what to hap what's going to happen, so you don't know what timeline to ask for. So that's why you can sort of get anything when you go into the future. But if events are sufficiently big, big events, then you don't have that problem because those big events have impacts across a large swath of timelines, and that's what we pick up. So if there's a big earthquake, we may remote view a devastating earthquake, and we may not experience it in our timeline. That doesn't mean the remote viewing is wrong. It means that in our timeline, we have evidence of that earthquake. Some, some rocker does come along and say, you know, that's a big earthquake. But it may be different in magnitude. What we should be saying when that happens is, well, that must have knocked the, the, the bejesus out of my other self. <laughs> that, that was, I wouldn't want to be my other self. He must be going through hell right now. So in, in this sense, what we have learned with our science project, our, our climate change science project, is when we remote view the future, we can predict the essence of what's coming even if we can't predict the details because of the multiple reality issue. So whenever we do this and we remote view 10 years into the future, five years into the future, the details you can just about guarantee will always be wrong. But the big stuff, the big essence will be correct. And that is really great. By the way, if we did have intervention with regard to the meteors, that's how you create other timelines. You pick up information from the future, bring it back to the present, and then do something with it. That's why the military has an interest in remote viewing. You see a terrorist event, you bring that back to the present, you catch mm -hmm. the bad guys before they can do the terrorist event. But you actually watched it in the first, in the first one. So in, in effect so, here, we're not just talking about remote viewing, but we're also talking about remote influencing as well. Is that correct? Well, you're not using your mind to influence people, but you're, in, you're, you're influencing what, what you will experience. Influencing by, outcomes. Yes, exactly. By observing and by predictively being able to insert our exactly. human consciousness into that time stream, event stream. Exactly. And people have done this intuitively forever. Yeah. For example, how many times have you heard true stories where a spouse would go to her or his spouse and say, I don't want you to go to work today because something bad's going to happen to the train. I just sense it. Mm -hmm. And the person stays home just to appease the spouse. And sure enough, there's a train wreck and everybody's killed or something. Yeah. Or a submarine sinking. There's lots of stories of sailors going AWOL before a submarine goes out and ends up sinking with all hands died because their spouses or themselves, they felt funny about it. So what happened was they perceived the future and then acted on that perception, risking, you know, court-martial or whatever, because of those strong intuitive perceptions. Well, that's what remote feeling is. You're bringing information back, and then if you do anything on that information, then you've changed what that experience is going to be. The only sort of real challenge for this is it takes a lot of effort to do these experiments, and you're dealing with predicting things five, ten years out, and we're an all-volunteer organization, and we have to beg our viewers to do this. There's very few, um, fewer than, there are like fewer than ten really good remote viewers that, can, that are capable of doing this after all these years of training literally hundreds of people. It's like piano. We've trained many people to play sort of in an analogous way. We've trained many people to play the piano, but there's only a few people we'd put in Carnegie Hall. Correct. 
It's like that. And that's the trouble because everyone's volunteer. So we're trying to address that issue by getting some income stream going to the remote viewers, but it's slow and very difficult. So right now we only have a few people who are capable of doing that. But I must say that the giggle factor, the the laughter is silenced. Even the worst skeptics are not laughing anymore. So we've been around long enough. No more calling of us deluded. Uh, the, the science of remote viewing is sufficiently well established with all of the public experiments we've had. We're the only venue that exists for these big, huge science experiments mm -hmm. um, for, that are you know, public science experiments with this outreach program we have using these better than military grade remote viewers. So, you know, uh, at least at least people are watching and, and, and listening and no one's laughing anymore. So we've gotten that far, but we haven't gotten to the point where we can turn around these major projects every few years and keep on describing change. Because theoretically, we've demonstrated the principle that we could do this repeatedly. And it, it would be nice to have a climate, to have a planet change group where constantly you're yes. remote viewing under yeah. squeaky clean uh, uh, scientific conditions with total randomization of the target pool, everything, all the good stuff every five years. And so you're looking into the future every five years, knowing full well that the details will be wrong because you know the science of it, but that the big things will be correct. There'll be a strong correspondence with the big things. Knowing those big things is really valuable. Knowing yeah. that climate was going to be much different in 2013 than it was in 2008 and much worse. That's really helpful. Knowing that there was going to be some potentially devastating major events before June 1st, 2013, that's really helpful to know. So anyway. A little bit of um, Q&A. In terms sure. of this, this global uh, climate change project that you undertook, I know there was a lot of criticism because people felt that you missed it. We did not have, for instance, the Sydney Opera House underwater. We did not see the coastlines of Africa and the United States inundated by um, <clears throat> huge tsunamis. And so the outer rim of projected outcomes didn't occur. And because of that, people look at this and they say, well, they totally missed it. Um, I guess defend is probably not the word we want to use, but how do you deflect the criticism to get the people who you're presenting your information to to see the advantage to what you're doing? You just explained a lot of that, but at the same time, you're dealing with people who are purposefully skeptic. Yeah, you know, I already addressed that entire issue, and that's exactly what will happen. So I'm glad you raised it again. That's what will happen. People will say, but where are the tsunamis? Even after you've just heard the entire explanation of multiple realities and one reality, they'll, they'll work. By the way, we never said that the Opera House in Sydney would be underwater, right. but there would be, the remote viewing data seemed to suggest that there would be large, actually tsunamis is not the best word, it's probably displacement waves. Okay. Impacts causing large displacement waves, which can, tsunamis are only a few feet big, displacement waves can be really, really big. And so it looked like there were going to be displacement waves due to these meteor impacts. But the thing that's, that's important to understand is that if you deflect the meteors, if you move the meteors, the tsunamis or the displacement waves are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's the, I was actually asking the question, remember I said, let me sort of be like the devil's advocate. Yeah. yeah. I was asking in a more critical way, which is, isn't it a cop-out to avoid saying that the project and remote viewing was a failure? The answer to that has to be repeated over and over again for years for people finally to get their head around it. Physicists have had decades to look at the yes. multiple worlds interpretation that Hugh Everett came up with. And to this day, 82% still reject it, but at least 18% now accept it. Whereas back in 1957, there was only one person that accepted it, Hugh Everett. So, you know, yeah. It takes, and physicists, no one ever claims that physicists are stupid. They, they're smart people, but they have a very difficult time with this. So when you find people out there in the masses also having a difficult time with this, um, it's understandable. So the multiple realities 
e explanation is not a cop-out. It's, it's an accurate statement of what actually happens. And we have done tremendous amount of research, including the year-long project that was published in leading peer-reviewed journal, to test literally just the existence of multiple realities. So what we say is that those versions of realities where the tsunamis actually did occur weren't the ones that we experienced, but there is evidence to suggest that the reason we didn't experience them is that there, were, there looks like there was intervention. The big herring that's here, of course, is the obvious impact of the Russian. Something hit the Russian meteor, and that was so wacky, so really weird, it leads to question of whether the climate project data was literally used to prepare so that some type of intervention could happen. Now, that's a bit speculative, because we don't have governmental officials or ET officials coming here and confessing, but the video of the impact is sort of very striking. So when people hear this, I guarantee you what will happen is there'll be a pause, and then they'll say, yeah, but where were the tsunamis? <laughs> they'll say yeah. the same question yeah. over again. So it doesn't matter how yeah, long Yeah, they I loop it, loop it, answer, loop it back, and it they always loop, winds back. But my job, my job is sort of yeah. the front man for the Farsight Institute, the guy that explains what we've been doing, is to keep talking and keep explaining no matter how many times they keep asking the same question. So my job is not to get frustrated with them and start calling them idiots. My job is to keep explaining. It's taken, mm -hmm. since 1957 up to the current time, this many decades for only 18% of physicists to finally get it and understand the multiple worlds interpretation as being correct. 82% still don't. And we're probably looking at a situation where we're going to have to wait for them to, re they're mostly older, so we're going to have to wait for them to retire and die and simply be replaced generationally. That's probably what we're, we're looking at. So if it was difficult for physicists over the decades to wrap their head around this multiple reality thing, you know, give everybody else a break. It's hard for everybody to sort of wrap their head. But it's probably the single most important finding that we've ever had with that remote viewing search, the issue of multiple realities. It, it gives us purchase into understanding how all sorts of seemingly unexplainable things could happen. It actually leads to an explanation of how extraterrestrial spacecraft could get here. Yes. You know, in yes. violation of the speed of light, uh, interdimensional spacecraft. Well, the assumed it, it, speed of light, anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it brings open a whole new realm of physics that basically discards all types of misunderstandings of how reality actually works. But that will take some years to get through. Right now, just the acceptance of remote viewing as a real phenomenon will rattle and roll the university academy um, in ways that are so profound we can hardly imagine. So it's, it's um, a big change. A Do you think change. that it was problematic for your predictions uh, to have such a hard deadline as June 2013. In other words, you were pretty definitive on this. This wasn't some wide window. You really narrowed it down pretty tightly. And yeah, because doing that, that you yeah. pegged a deadline. Yeah, because that was the deadline for the experiment, meaning the experiment was mm -hmm. set up in advance to, to know what things were like by June 1st, 2013. So we had to keep to that. Now, there's a little bit of a misnomer here. That doesn't mean that everything was supposed to happen on June 1st. That means that by June 1st, I mean, remote viewers always have sort of a, a temporal wide-angle lens. If something is obvious on the ground, for example, if they see a big earth, of the target, back We're up temporally in time and say what causes wreckage and they'll see the faulting and they'll see the earthquake and the crumbling buildings that may have happened months earlier so that's sort of the way the remote viewing process works the other thing we've sort of concluded now and it's pretty much set is that when you send remote viewers to a particular target in the future they tend psychologically to gravitate to many of them, not all of them, but they tend psychologically to gravitate to the most extreme versions of that future. 
So if there's a earthquake, they'll go and find the earthquake timelines that are the most extreme. And if there's meteor impacts, they'll mm -hmm. go and find the timelines that are most extreme. But that's very useful. That's, this does not happen, by the way, if you, lo if you look at past targets. So if you're looking at the Battle of Gettysburg, or if you're looking at a presidential address by Richard Nixon, or if you're looking at you know, something in the past, you don't have any of these accuracy problems. They describe exactly what's there, not an extreme version of it. You get exactly that. But when you're going to the future, there seems to be a tendency for many remote viewers to drift in the direction of the most extreme change. But knowing that in advance, that's very helpful. Because when we do remote view the future, again, this does not affect past targets. But when we remote view the future targets, when we see extreme things, we know now that that is the worst that could happen. And that our future may not be as bad, but there should be some evidence of the essence of that in our future. So it may be that our future is not as bad because we act on whatever we find and create a better future. But it may also be that some other thing happens. For example, if there was an earthquake, we didn't do anything to experience a lesser earthquake, but there's no intervention involved. But nonetheless, we do expect an earthquake around that date, but the magnitude will be, you know, it, it may be bad, but it may very well be less than, <clears throat> than the worst case scenario that some of those remote viewers picked up. But simply knowing that there's an earthquake coming around that date is really helpful. Yeah. You had uh, spoken early in this interview about the illusion of time. And we talk about timelines and we talk about multiple universes, multiple reality streams. How problematic is time given <clears throat> given that it basically is part of the perceptual aspect of our human consciousness, when we move out of our present reality stream, is that a constant or does it vary as well in remote viewing? Our consciousness structures events in a sequential time-ordered fashion. Right. But that doesn't mean, yeah, that doesn't mean that time actually exists in a real, in a real way. It means that our movement of perception moves in a way that seems to have a temporal order to it. Yeah. But you can remote view things in the past, so the past must still exist. And according to the theory of multiple realities, multiple or other worlds, all those realities exist simultaneously, meaning there isn't a current now, and all other things in the past don't happen. They're gone. They're, mm -hmm. And everything that's in the future hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet, so it, it doesn't exist. That's not correct. What does happen is what we call simultaneous sequentiality, meaning everything does happen one after the next, but it happens simultaneously, meaning the past and the present and the future all happen at the same time. Our perception follows a temporal order where it goes through these things one thing after the next in an order that seems to us to have a spacing that we call time. But there is, you know, on the mathematics of sort of like superstring theory mathematics, a lot of physicists are very puzzled by it because in their equations, time cancels out. It just goes away. And they have, they have a devil of a time keeping time in to those equations. Everything seems to just happen and time sort of goes away. And the experimental results are very clear on that. Um, you know, the quantum mechanical experimental results are very clear on that as well. If the, I won't go into the details of it, but it was originally found in what's called Wheeler's delay, John Wheeler's delayed choice experiment in quantum mechanics, where basically a, a, an event happens, but before that event happened, a uh, you know, a, a, something had to occur that would probabilistically s cause one event to happen or another event to happen. Mm -hmm. All right? Sort of like so, a logic tree. Yeah, a logic tree. Like something had to happen. Like A had to happen or B had to happen. Mm -hmm. And if one of those two things happen, it'll determine the final outcome. So you'll get outcome or outcome two. But the 
the, the decision to, um, to, to actually um, create one of those things happens after the events past the point of deciding A or B. Meaning, you have a particle going and it can go through path A or go through path B. And there's some type of microprocessor that will make a determination on a random basis of whether it's going to go through A or go through B. Well, after the particle already passes that point where it had to go through A or B, the microprocessor makes a choice of what's going to happen. And it may seem impossible, but it's called the delayed choice experience. It, it, it makes a choice by um, deciding, since quantum mechanics don't really happen, particles don't really happen unless you observe them, it makes a cho choice on whether the thing is going to be observed eventually. And so if it makes a choice on whether That's it's observed... That's an important distinction, too. That's yeah. very important. So it makes, it makes yeah. a decision after the particle has already passed a decision plate, a point of A or going through A and B, the microprocessor makes the decision of whether, whether to register it or not, whether to look at it or not. And it, it turns out that what the microprocessor does determines whether the particle ends up in one spot or the next. So, mind you, the microprocessor didn't make the decision until after the particle had already passed the fork between A and B. <laughs> but once the microprocessor makes the decision that it's going to do something with the particle downstream, it's deterministic. It's done. And you can control whether it went through A or B. So the only way that could have happened is if the outcome happens simultaneously with the starting point. Meaning, you know, you can't have the, the, you, you, the, the, according to classical ways of thinking, once the particle has passed the forking spot, you shouldn't be able to do anything to it. I mean, it's already determined whether it's going to end up in spot one or spot two. At the, you know, it's going to, if once, once you pass the, if you're in a canoe and you're going and you hit a fork in the river, once you pass the fork and you're downstream, you shouldn't be able to do anything that will change your position, whether it's on the left fork or the right fork. You've already passed to the fork, so you're already downstream. You, the, choice, the choice has already been made. But if there is some way to, um, in, a, in a macro world, to, to influence the fork decision when you actually hit the fork, then that's what, they're, that's what essentially they're doing. They're doing something downstream in the river that is affecting whether the canoe went to the right or the left when they did the fork. But they're making that choice. They're actually doing that thing after the canoe already passed that point. Do you get the idea? That's why it's yeah. called Wheeler's yeah. Delayed Choice Experiment. By the way, if you think that's difficult to comprehend, it's difficult for physicists to comprehend. It's always been considered a mystery, even for physicists to this day. But it doesn't, it doesn't stay mysterious within the other world's interpretation of, of physical reality because uh, all things in that sense happen simultaneously. And so it doesn't matter when the decision is made, you are still going to, you affect the beginning when you do something at the end instantly. I mean, it's mm. not, yeah. So that's called the Wheeler, John Wheeler's Delayed Choice Experiment. I believe you can even look the Wheeler's, that's W-E-W-H-E-E-L-E-R, -E 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 Wheeler's Delayed Choice Experiment. You can look it up in, in Wikipedia. It's a fascinating um, quantum mechanical experiment. It started out as a thought, as a thought experiment, something that John Wheeler was just thinking, but it's been verified in laboratory since then. So what we have is simultaneous sequentiality. The past, the present, and the future, all versions, multiple versions of the past, multiple versions of the future, everything happens literally at the same time, even though our experience is apparently temporal. I think for a lot of people, it's simply 
and even I who these are very abstract concepts, but I understand them probably more on an intuitive level than I do mathematically. I'm not a mathematician, but I do understand them intuitively. I think for a lot of people, they struggle with these concepts because these concepts move their consciousness out of linear time, chronological thinking, and sequential step logic, which is what we're entrained into. Yep. It's very different from our current reality. And in fact, all of these things, even the idea of multiple worlds, parallel universes, that was really violently objected to back in 1957. So that was why Hugh Everett left physics. Mm -hmm. He was so disgusted by his response. So, you know, the very fact that only 18% of mainstream physicists now adopt it as the correct view uh, interpreting macro reality gives you an idea of how difficult these ideas are to sort of integrate into sort of your normal daily thinking. Well, how difficult is it to navigate within a discipline like physics, which is very rooted in mathematics and logical thought, <clears throat> understanding that physics has changed a lot over the last 80 years especially, and to move that into what we call the realm of metaphysics, dealing with consciousness and even going into the shamanic where you're basically dealing with dream time experiences where I mm -hmm. think a lot of people have an easier time grasping some of this but it's termed mystical as opposed to quote hard science yeah you know there's a lot of things that occur in physical experience in one's life that science has never been able to fully understand mm -hmm. and so what we have are experiences that mainstream science literally disregards. Mainstream science likes to connect the dots. And they pride themselves on looking at data, statistically analyzing those data, and connecting the dots. The trouble is they have theories that don't match physical reality. And so they connect only the dots that they want to connect. They screen out all of the data. They screen out all the data that don't fit those dots. They literally say, I'm not going to look at that because that doesn't fit what we're thinking about. And so they come up with an interpretation that matches what they are willing to look at. And you can do that with any theory you want. If I have a theory of gravity that says it only works going upwards, and I only look at balls that are thrown up or rocks that are thrown up, and I say, we see, everything just goes up. But I never look at things coming back down. I don't have any data that suggests it. And if I wanted to push that theory, I'd look at you and say, Randy, I have no data whatsoever. There is absolutely not a shred of evidence that suggests that gravity pulls things back down. All the evidence simply says gravity moves things upwards only. And you'd come in and you'd say, but I've talked to Aunt Matilda. She said she dropped some eggs and they fell on the ground. And you'd say, that's, and, and, I, and, and I'd come back in and I'd say, you're dealing with fringe people? You're dealing with, you know, yeah. people that sort of are lunatics. And we do science here. We take observations and we measure things exactly. And I'm telling you, upon a level of science, things only move upwards with gravity. They do not move downward. You have to tell your Aunt Matilda that she's just, you know, in that fringe realm. And you, you can't be taking that seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they do. And so what we have is, is a situation where they what are the data? What are the real data? And let's look at all the data. The biggest mistake in science is to say, I have a theory and I'm going to find the data that fit my theory. <laughs> I've actually seen presentations of graduate students who have studied under, you know, you know full, full faculties at universities actually say that. Now I'm going to go find the data that fit my theory. You can't do that. You have to look at all the data and throw them to your theory and see if your theory is okay. You can't go and select out your data that fit your theory, but a lot of people do. And mainstream science does that tremendously, especially with regard to mainstream physics. So what people do when they have these shamanic experiences and dream experiences, they have experiences and they know intuitively the thing was real, but mainstream science doesn't have a place for it. So they disregard it. When people have premonitions, intuitions about things to come, and those things happen, mainstream science either is just simply silent on it, 
or mainstream science says, you know, it was just lots of people have funny ideas, and occasionally one of the ideas matches up with something that actually happens, and you know, it's sort of idiosyncratic to the situation, but it's not, it's not really a phenomenon. It's not really science. It's just this person had this, and so either they ignore these facts. Or, for example, when a submarine goes down, you have an extraordinary number of, of sailors going AOL that day, not going to work, not showing up, and the submarine goes out and sinks. And science will just come along and say, well, maybe they heard something that we don't know about, about the reactor not working or the propellers. You know, root of mouth, they were suspicious. And there's a good explanation for what happened. Maybe there was a bug going around, the flu or something. We have a lot, a lot of those people. stories around uh, the events of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Uh, um, I talked to people who intuitively did not go to work that day for no good reason. Yeah, the, the World Trade Center thing is a uh, big, big bugaboo. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's one of the things that we won't do at the Farsight Institute. It's a very dodgy event. I mean... It's a very dodgy event. So there's a lot of things that are not explained that we could go into with the, with the remote viewing, but we won't do it because, you know, um, we know the military does not want us to go there. So we just let sort of leave that whole World Trade Center event untouched. So and in a sense, it, you've already kind of got an answer anyway about it because they don't want you to go there. They definitely don't want us to go there. I mean, some things that are already very clear and not controversial is that it's not been it's not been publicized in the by by the official sources. Mm -hmm. But there have been documentaries about it that are uh, by you know, Ed Asner and so on that, that are that are they've been aired on public television that the Building Seven that was right next to the World Trade Center was demolished. It was not. It was not hit by anything, right. and it was literally brought down by demolition charges. Yeah. And so the other stuff, like World Trade Center buildings, the towers, there's all types of questions about that. But it, it, it appears to me that nobody really needs us to tell people what happened. So we're just staying away from that because the military definitely does not want us to do that. Same thing with Flight 800, TWA Flight 800. There's already two very well done. Um, uh, there's already two very well done uh, documentaries on TWA Flight 800. So, that, uh, you know, they don't. Certain things don't need us, so we just stay away. Especially if the military doesn't want us to go certain places. So, um, anyway, so that's. That's um, uh, anyway. So but yeah, you you just raised that, and some people always say, you know, like if you know all these things, why don't you find? Well, out and that what? question has come up as well. Why do you have limitations on where you will or won't go in terms of certain very controversial things? And look, the military people sit on our board of directors for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes. <laughs> there are yeah. certain things we're not going to do, and uh, so. But that doesn't mean there's important things that we, we're doing things that are absolutely crucial that nobody else is doing. For example, we, let me just go through some of the projects that we've done. We, we've had um, a major project on, um, let me actually go through, since we've, since recently, we just had a project that we're going to be talking about eventually uh, called the Atlantis Project, which was a high technological society on Earth that destroyed itself. It wasn't destroyed by natural cataclysm, destroyed itself. And we found out where they are. Uh, we found the ruins. We know what happened, what they were doing. They were about 100 years more advanced technologically than us. They are our ancestors. We're the descendants. We know where the ruins are. We have good Google Earth imagery of the ruins themselves. And we know exactly what they did to destroy themselves. I mean, and that happened only 70,000 years ago. And that is definitely something that the mainstream is not out there publicizing. The military and the governments do know about this. They do know about the civilization. They know about the ruins. But we came up with a project that described the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. 
Secondly, we did a project on an active technological base on Mars that was, that was clearly visible in a NASA JPL's Malin Space Science Systems photograph, and we did a, a completely blind study on it and found out exactly what it was, and we have a really good picture of it. We know the exact location. And if you look at Google Earth Mars option, um, the exact spot where the base is has been blocked out, has been smudged out. <laughs> and it, it's a very clear censoring act. I mean, it's not, it's not even, they're not even hiding it, but after the project came out. I mean, so there's, you know, we've done, we've done things that you can't find anywhere else, but there's certain things that we can do and we're not stopped in doing there, and there are mm -hmm. other things that go too close to home, and the, we, we're, we're definitely able to read the, the tea leaves on that one, and we know we're not supposed to do it. We did a project on an exploding planet, a planet in the orbits of Mars and Jupiter that exploded, confirming a, and that's how the asteroid belt came to be, confirming a theory that, and a, and a huge amount of evidence that was supported by Thomas Van Flandern, the very mainstream astronomer, head of his Department of Celestial Mechanics, the Naval Observatory. And we did the, uh, you know, of course, the Multiple Universe Project. So we do a whole bunch of stuff, but there are certain things that we, you know, we don't, that we, somebody's, you know, they, they tolerate us. Maybe mm -hmm. I can put it mm -hmm. that way. We're still in existence. We're still functioning. That means the government, the sources, powers that be, the military, they're divided. Some like what we're doing and think it's very important for the future. Other well, may be opposed to it. But if we went too far, then we could be shut down. And so, you know, I'm not going to be doing well, any projects. And I don't think We're you have to, I don't think we, you know, I understand that, that was a, that's a difficult position to be in. And I think we asked a fair question, and I think you gave a fair answer. To be honest with you, you know the, I'll call them the ultra-paranoid fringe of the counterculture media out there is going to say, well, Farsight's controlled by the military. They're controlled by the government. They're a setup. They're disinfo or COINTELPRO. And you're never going to be able to satisfy those kind of inquiries. But I am very pleased that you at least addressed why you do not go into certain areas, Courtney. Yeah. People ask us all these questions, and we say sometimes we just, not only do we not know, but we purposely don't know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like I mean, people have asked us forever, who, who, who killed Jack Kennedy? Do you think we really couldn't figure that out? I, I have no idea who killed Jack Kennedy, but I know we're not going to figure that out. <laughs> but, you know, so we've got the World Trade Center, flight at TWA, uh, flight 800, who killed Jack Kennedy? We're not going to touch it. You know, interesting things. Hey, Courtney, uh, our signal is fading here, so this would probably be a good place to take a break. Your video is actually dropping out. We're going to take a break here on this side of the segment. We're going to come back for segment two with my guest, Courtney Brown. We're going to talk about Atlantis, the true story, and the work that the Farsight Institute has done in telling us more about the history of ancient Atlantis. We'll do all of that and more when we come back on the other side of Planet Radio.